Okay. Hey, can you still hey, see me? Sorry. Everybody, welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio. My name is Joshua Lewis. This is Joel, and we got Michael over here. We're going to be hanging out today uh, discussing the 1689 London Baptist Confession. Before we dive into the subject matter, introduce Joel, talk about all that stuff. Uh, we want to let you know a little bit who Remnant Radio is and who we're all about, so you guys stay tuned. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for staying tuned with us today. Uh, we've got a regular show today. On Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we create uh, content from 4 to 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. Usually comes out live right at that time. Uh, a little bit late today, but uh, not to worry whatsoever. If, you, if you're if you watching online, you haven't already, make sure to like the video, subscribe to the video, because we're coming out with content just like this every single week. We've got some really crazy content coming down the pipe. We're talking about aliens. people. Got aliens. aliens. I got, I got uh, Gary Bates coming on talking about aliens. I got Heiser coming on talking about aliens. There's this new document that's going to be released from the federal government here pretty soon on aliens. So we're going to, well, out of Christians talk about this, think about this. We've got mm -hmm. someone coming on talking to us about th these people claiming to be Christian witches. Uh, I see what you <laughs> said. <laughs> uh, people claiming to be Christian witches. Like, how? what does the, the Bible say about witchcraft? And then and we got the next kind of two Wednesdays talking about demons. And we're talking about devils for yeah. a couple of weeks. <laughs> that's, the, that's how you got to say it. That's the charismatic world. Devil. Like, you know, new levels, new devils. <laughs> I heard that. So, so uh, the next man, two Wednesdays. If you're in new I, levels. I think that's Joyce Meyer, for real. <laughs> What a way to start a show. There we go. Uh, without further ado, uh, no, no, uh, Joel, tell us a little about yourself and your ministry before we, we dive into the subject matter. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. My name is Joel Webin. I currently reside in Hutto, Texas, uh, close enough to Austin to have ministry opportunity, economic opportunity, and further not, far enough outside of Austin, Texas uh, to not have my police defunded separate county. I pastor a church <laughs> called Covenant Bible Church, and I lead a ministry called Right Response Ministries. Joel, Joel's been doing some pretty cool stuff. You guys need to go check out his YouTube channel, uh, Right Response. You can check out him on YouTube. Uh, he's got a lot of really cool stuff out there that you need to check out. Uh, I didn't mention this at the top, and we should have, uh, and I need to be better at this, but we're doing this book club, uh, Walter Martin, Kingdom of the Colts. You need to check it out. It's in the Patreon link in the description. Uh, if you're not a member of Patreon, it's like five bucks a month. You can join up there, uh, get extra content. One of the things you get to do is you get access to these Zoom links where we're doing this book club. Uh, this week, we're going through Mormonism, so read that chapter, hang out with us this Saturday. Saturday from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. Central Standard Time, and we're going to dive into that chapter, so i got to make sure to get that out of the way. Uh, but today we're talking about the London Baptist Confession. Yeah. Uh, uh, Joel, you 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 did not come from this tradition, and you kind of found yourself in this vein within this tribe. Uh, why the 1689? Why do you hold to this? How did that come about? How did you become part of this community of believers? Michael Rountree. <laughs> Michael Roundtree did it. I, I did. I, I, I taught you about election, right? Remember back in the you day, did. you were a very hardcore Arminian, and I That's said, right. let's turn to Romans 9. That's and, right. You uh, got me. And, now, and then suddenly you were 1689. <laughs> yeah, well, not suddenly. It took about twelve years. But yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah no. Lost. So I, for those of you who don't know, um, me and Michael, we go, we go way back. About, I guess at this point, Michael would be what thirteen, fourteen years. Yeah, yeah. Something came to like came that. to Wellspring one day, That's and right. uh -huh. uh, where I where I pastor, and then started helping me when I was a youth pastor, and. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we had a, a discipleship relationship, and um, and then Joel went off, planted a, a church that just blew up. How many? Didn't you have like a hundred something baptisms in two years or something yeah. like that? Yeah, about a hundred, between like a hundred and ten and a hundred twenty baptisms. I can remember some households. Beyond that, I do not remember if I baptized anyone. But ah, uh, <laughs> there. <laughs> oh man. But so. yeah, no, God was super gracious, and but uh, but a lot of it started with you, Michael, and and so to, to answer your question, Josh, I was really came from um, you know more of a charismatic tradition. My my dad was Pentecostal, and so he went to Baylor uh, when he was in college, and he was going to Highland Baptist in Waco, Texas, at the time, and that was before Antioch. If you're familiar with Antioch Church in Waco, Texas, and they do a big missions um, conference once a year. And so Antioch came out of Highland Baptist, and it really kind of started as like the young adults college thing. And so my dad was going, you know, he was raised in a, in a typical kind of Southern Baptist uh, church, cessationist 
uh, position in terms of gifts of the Spirit. He went to college uh, to Baylor, but went to Highland Baptist, and Highland Baptist was cessationist, but they had their their rebel, you know, young adults program that later became, um, you know, Antioch. And so my dad was filled with the spirit, you know, and, uh, and finally, you know, really got serious about what it means to be a Christian and, Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and pressured my mom into speaking in tongues. And once she finally did, you know, he was able to marry her and they adopted (laughs) me, you know, and and so, so anyway, so, but the point is I I was raised out of that. My dad would, would have held to a Pentecostal, um, P- Pentecostal doctrine is so different. I, I recognize in you guys, you would view subsequent refilling to the Spirit, filled at, at the moment of conversion. Gifts might be awakened later on with subsequent refillings and as we eagerly desire those gifts. And so, and my dad came into that position. So he was Pentecostal for a while and then he became vineyard um, and kind of, you know, and, and the here not yet of the kingdom and those kind of things, um, George Eldon Ladd and and that's kind of what I grew up with. And then I went to Christ for the Nations in Dallas. And that's where I met Michael Roundtree. Christ for the Nations, my, my dad, in his defense, didn't know, and, and neither did I. But I would say Christ for the Nations um, was not um, a good, charismatic experience. I think there were many false teachers there um, and uh, guys who would align with Benny Hinn and Joyce Meyer and, and people that I would strongly disagree with. And, and I think you guys would in, in many aspects as well. And then I came out of that, you know, where they taught you could lose your salvation and, they, you know, all these different garbage doctrines and uh, and found Jack Deere's church because I was familiar with the vineyard. And he, you know, was friends with John Wimber back in the day. And so I was looking for a church and that was my experience. I, was, I wanted something like, like my dad's church, the vineyard that was continuationist. Um, but not so crazy, and um, and that also had a really strong view of grace. And so I found Jack's church, and that's where I met Michael, and that's where I became a Calvinist. And, and then down the road, I became Reformed Baptist, and much to Michael's disappointment, became cessationist. So, yeah. No, uh, so with this, uh, this kind of progression, um, Calvinism is, uh, when you're talking about Calvinism, you're talking about the soteriological system total depravity, uh, uh, unconditional, t- unconditional election, election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. And I might not have gotten it in the perfect order, uh, but but saying, hey, these are that's Calvinism, or what we'd call like a neo-Calvinism, but the, the Reformed tradition of becoming really Reformed, and not just soteriology, the, the study right. of salvation, but becoming Reformed in many different areas of our ecclesiology, our church mm-hmm. discipline, um, our, our church piety, the regulative principle, how we actually conduct ourselves in worship. So, so the 16 the Calvinism was kind of your gateway into right. all of Reformed right. theology as a whole. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe this is a good place for us to ask the question, what, what is the 1689 uh, as you see it? Um, yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. And, and kind of, you know, what, what got me from Calvinistic soteriology, because you're absolutely right, Josh, you know, it's kind of just the, the gateway drug. But what got me from being Calvinist, and when I'm using the word, it's exactly what you're saying. It's just speaking of soteriology, a reformed view of salvation. What got me from there to truly reformed, a capital R reformed, um, although some Presbyterians would, would have some choice words, but, um, but <laughs> truly reformed, was really, I just got tired of doing theology a la carte. It just was so exhausting. You know what I mean? And I'm sure you guys can relate to this. I, I you know, And I know we would disagree on, on some things, but it is really hard to just, all right, I came to a new issue. I, I, here's another thing. Here's another thing. What's our stance on this? What? And I realize that every Christian is confessional. It's just, it's either a historic confession that was written by a group of qualified men and has stood the test of time, or it's Fred's confession, you know, in the basement of his church, or it's Joel's confession that's still kind of being written and rewritten in his head, and he doesn't even really know what it is and can't remember certain chapters. And so I just really, like, everyone, everyone is confessional. Just like R.C. Sproul says, you know, everyone's a theologian. Uh, you're either a good one or a bad one. Everyone is confessional, meaning everyone, everyone has a confession of what they believe. And so I just decided, you know what, instead of, uh, instead of making my own confession and maybe by, the, by my deathbed, I come up with something, you know, halfway decent and hopefully orthodox, uh, maybe I could just stand on the shoulder of giants and, uh, and, and, and just, you know, work from there. So it, it, real quick, I, so I can say what the 1689 is now. I'm, I'm ready for that. I just wanted to say that first. <laughs> Do you have any pushback or any thoughts on that, Josh and Michael? No, you're good. Um, uh, pushback on 
on what specific on, the, on just on just my you know my my little statement on why you know my my advocating for why I think Christians should be confessional. No, I think I think every Christian should pick up a 1689. They should pick up a Westminster. They should pick up mm-hmm. all of the historic creeds. Um, Michael was asking me about this right before we started filming, and he's like, "How do you know all of this about history about about this specific issue of the 1689 and and the other kind of related creeds around the Protestant era?" And I was just like, "Well, I'm just really tired of being." like a, an evangelical that is completely untied from history and what the right. church yeah. has no, we're, confessed. Yeah, we actually like that. We kind of lament the fact that we're, uh, well, I, I won't say we lament it, but we really respect the fact that you are part of a, a confessional yeah. uh, uh, group. But, you know, at the same time, as much as I respect that, I can't just like suddenly be cessationist. Like I'm a continuationist yeah. through and through. I understand that. There's certain things that like I can't uninterpret, right? Like I can't right. just change on a dime like that. And, and for you, it wasn't, to be fair, not on a dime. It took you many years. Uh, same mm-hmm. with the Sabbatarian uh, practice. Right. We can talk about all those things. Yeah, and I think, and I think the other thing... you are confessional, you know, like you probably yeah. would prescribe to like the Heidelberg, for instance. You know, you know what I mean? There's, sure. there's different levels of confessions. Some are, are intentionally more general and broad. And then, and then like the Westminster and 1689 get more specific. But you guys would hold to certainly historic creeds. And you would yeah. even hold to probably like the Savoy Decla- Declaration or different um, even confessions that are, that are more particular than mm-hmm. just merely the creeds. Um, but then there's just, you know, another level of confessions that just says, you know, that has an answer for everything yeah. virtually. Now, and those are some of the things where you guys would say, okay, well, we would just, we would part ways on some of these particular issues. And I think I, I get that. Yeah. So, and now even on the 1689, there was a 1644 also. And can yeah. you talk about 1689, 1644, and then maybe throw in Westminster Confession? Well, How does that fit into all this? So yeah. the Savoy, he mentioned those. So let's let's start with, uh, <laughs> because because there is a there is a chronological order here. So uh, in talking about the 1689 London, 1689 London Baptist Confession, uh, also known as like what is it called, the Philadelphia Confession, the Second right. London Baptist Confession. Uh, well, maybe, so Second London Baptist, and then became Philadelphia later. But yes, may, uh-huh. maybe let's start with the Westminster because that's that's okay. they're all written in light in response to of that in some sense, and off of the heels of that in some sense. So let's start right. with the Westminster, and then we'll we'll work our way from the 1644 in the Savoy, uh, or, or else it won't make any sense. <laughs> That's great. So so Westminster was 1646, so I got to make this little plug for my Reformed Baptist brothers and sisters. So 1644, if you know math, comes before 1646. However, <laughs> however <laughs> uh, you know, so so technically, the you know, the Baptists had something in the works. They had something written down, something official and formalized before the Westminster came out, because the running joke is, you know, that Reformed Baptists just took the Westminster and copied it and took out, you know, their stance on infant baptism and things like that. And you know what, to be fair, there's there's a lot of truth in that. So, like that so I would say, you know, so <laughs> Reformed Baptists, they came out in 1644. And the difference between the 1644, you know, Baptist document versus, you know, the, their, their declaration of particular Baptists versus the 1689 Second London Baptist Confession of Faith um, is really, it's a lot of it is just, um, is just specificity. It's, um, it's, Thoroughness. So the 1644 was just, if you hold that up next to the 1689, it's just going to be significantly more anemic. It's going to be more general. It's not going to address uh, certain issues that are later addressed in the 1689. And part of the reason, from what I've read, you know, there's really two reasons, and just general reasons. Um, one, the 1644, they, you know, kept it more general, kept it more anemic, more basic, um, in part uh, because they, they didn't want to start dotting I's and crossing T's that they did with the 1689, yet until the Presbyterians came out with their document, the Westminster in 1646, be, for the sake of trying to be ecumenical. And then secondly, I think, you know, it's fair to say, and also for the sake of checking their work against the Westminster, because Presbyterians yeah. are often theological bosses, and we've got to give them credit. So. <laughs> no, yeah. no doubt, no doubt. And I think uh, uh, with the, the response with the 1644, part of that was the the government at the time was witnessing these people baptize their immersion and they're going Anabaptist. And they were like, whoa, right. whoa, 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 not Anabaptist. In fact, the, the documentation of the 1644 and the 1689, I think start off out saying, we're writing this so that, you know, we're not those guys. That's like one of the right. primary motivations. Uh, and it's funny because people right now will tell you that a lot of the Baptist tradition comes from the Anabaptist. Do you have any like brief thoughts on that? 
Yeah, so I would just say, I mean, a few marks of Anabaptism, it depends who you ask and, and what branch, right? So everything, like if we talk about dispensationalism, which I'm sure we will, covenant theology, there's just a, a million different types of each of these positions. So it's just never that simple. But um, Anabaptist, you know, uh, at least at least traditionally, some of the marks uh, would be, um, well, one, I think that's really significant is they would hold to a very strong two-kingdom theology versus more of a Kuyperianism. And so uh, they were very much like, you, you are a citizen of heaven, you're a citizen of uh, the Church of Christ. Um, and, and so they would view, you know, the state and the civil magistrate and all those other worldly affairs as um, merely carnal, um, shallow, uh, fleshly. And, uh, and so they didn't understand what, what we, I think, would, would all three agree with um, in terms of the concept of sphere sovereignty, right? And there's there multiple spheres, but three dominant spheres instituted by God, the home, the church, and the state. And these, these spheres, although autonomous, these are governmental spheres, I should say that. They're all governments, right? The family is still government. It's a human government. It's familial government. And there's ecclesiastical government, right? Elders and deacons. There's a government there, regardless of what church polity you prescribe to, whether it's a you know, a bishop, you know, a hierarchy, or whether it's a presbytery, or whether it's congregational, or elder rule, or wh whatever it may be, there's a government. So there's a, a family government, there's a church government, and then there's a civil government. And so it's not like there's government, and then there's home and church. It's three forms of government in three sovereign spheres, and they're autonomous for, from one another. Um, they all have legitimate authorities, you know, not civil, but governmental authority established by God. Um, but we would acknowledge that they overlap, meaning there are times, like CPS would be a great example, there are times, as much as I'm like, man, get the government out of out of our family, get it out of our homes, and yet I, I would concede and say there are times where uh, parents forfeit their rights as as the governing officials over their children due to the abuse or or severe neglect, to where uh, that other government that's separate and independent, autonomous from the family, the civil government actually supersedes in those extreme cases and can take those children away. Um, and their right, their governmental right, you know, so anyways, Anabaptists would not be able to have those nuances, that kind of understanding. Um, it was just, hey, we're the church. Anabaptists, <laughs> they view the church of God in a, in a way, and this may be crass, but kind of like Chaz in Seattle, right? <laughs> like, like we're in America, but we're not America, and we're starting another nation inside. Of, and so, you know what I mean? Like, I, I think there was some of that going on. Uh, they were also pacifist. And so yep. from, from the Anabaptists, you get like the Amish, you get um, the, the Mennonites, Mennonites. Uh, brethren, you know, and and uh, and so it, it's not just, yeah, I think they had a correct view of baptism, although at, at times they were extreme. Um, but I think they had a correct view of baptism. But there's so much more that comes with that. Just like you were saying, Josh, with Calvinism, right? There's a, well, all right, there's the five points of Calvinism in terms of soteriology. But if, but, you know, you have to specify when you say Calvinist, what do you mean? Because you could mean I prescribe to all of John Calvin and there'd be a whole lot more that you're talking about. Yeah. And so same with Anabaptists. Yeah, I think they got baptism, right? A believer's baptism. Uh, and the Anabaptists, you know, they, they were that they didn't come up with that name that was given to them by their opponents, saying that you're rebaptizing. That's the idea. Whereas they would say, we're not rebaptizing; we're baptizing people for the first time because because an infant baptism was illegitimate. But with Anabaptists came all these other ideas of like pacifism, can't own guns, uh, you, you can't uh, defend property, you, you don't belong to the state, you're somehow completely severed. This sphere of the church is completely severed for any other, you know, divinely instituted sphere. And and you you get some I think some some wacky things so okay so uh, one of the things you just mentioned you talked about you know are, the, soteriologically do you ascribe to Calvinism versus like everything Calvin said you kind of made that distinction one of the somebody in the chat and somewhere up I think it was barely Protestant in our chat earlier sure. um, asked a question about the sacraments specifically what does the 1689 right. say about the sacraments because. You know, typically, Baptists tend to have a more Zwinglian memorial type of view uh, toward the sacraments, whereas Calvin had more of a, a real presence view that, and not that the body and blood physically right. turned spiritual into... spiritual presence. Right, but it was a spiritual presence uh, mm -hmm. by the Holy Spirit. And so what does the 1689 specifically say uh, with regard to the sacraments or... Yeah, I'll just say that. What does it say? Does it adopt Calvin's view, or is it more uh, Zwinglian? Um, I think it's in between. I, I can't say that it's uh, Calvin's view um, exactly. 
uh, but I think it's closer to Calvin's view than, than Zwingli's. Um, let me just read. So this is of the Lord's Supper, chapter 30 in the 1689, barely Protestant. I appreciate you asking me and not doing a quick Google search because you probably could have. But, uh, you know, so the 1689 says this, you know, the Supper of the Lord Jesus was instituted by him on the same night where he was betrayed to be observed. I'm kind of paras paraphrasing because it has old English language, but to be observed by his churches unto the end of the world for the perpetual remembrance. So there is that memorial remembrance and showing to all the world the sacrifice of himself and his death. So if you think of like 1 Corinthians 11, one of the things that, that I do when I administer the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, and even though I'm Baptist, I'm perfectly comfortable calling it a sacrament and not just an ordinance. Um, and so when I administer the supper, you know, in 1 Corinthians 11, it says, as often as you do this, you do in remembrance of me. But then, but then that text finishes, it concludes by saying that uh, also as often as you do this, there's, there's, um, there's a remembrance, there's a looking back, but there's also a proclaiming, a declaration moving forward, Amen. that you proclaim the Lord's death until, until he comes again. And so the 1689 would rec recognize a prophetic Lowercase p, don't get excited, Michael, but a prophetic sense of the Lord's Supper. I'm excited, uh, declaring, bro. <laughs> declaring what... you know, so, deep down continuation. Yeah. Your, your 1689 deep just down. wouldn't let you. I would just say what Doug Wilson says, right? Remember his debate with Mark Driscoll and... <laughs> Oh, Mark's yeah. like, dude, you're totally, you're totally a continuationist, and every, and I'm, I would kind of be in the same boat, and I would just be like, yeah, we live in a magical world, and I won't say continuationist. I'll just go back and read more Narnia, and you guys yeah. can probably call me. So, yeah, know. the the lines are blurring. Where we call you, it's, we call you a brother a eagerly. So go yeah. Ahead. So, all right, and so, so showing to all the world, so it's remembrance of Christ and his sacrifice, but it's also proclaiming, showing to all the world the sacrifice of Christ in his death. Uh, paragraph, and it says a, a few more things, but paragraph two, in this ordinance, Christ is not offered up, right? So not transubstantiation. We're not um, subjecting the Son of God to be crucified all over again. It's a once and for all sacrifice. So no, no, it says no real sacrifice is made at all for the remission of sin, um, for the quick or dead, um, the, the living quick, living or dead, but only a memorial of that once offer, that once and for all offering of himself upon the cross um, and a spiritual ob oblation of all possible praise unto God for the same. So that the uh, popish sacrifice of the mass, as they call it, is most abominable, injurious to Christ's own sacrifice, the alone propitiation for the sins of the elect. Uh, paragraph three, I'm almost there. Uh, the Lord Jesus hath in this ordinance uh, appointed his ministers to pray and bless the elements of the bread and wine and thereby set them apart for a common, uh, um, uh, set them apart from a common use to a holy use and to take and break the bread. Jesus, he took the bread and giving thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body for you. Uh, and to take the cup, they are communicating also themselves to give both to um, the communicants. Um, and then uh, the denial of the cup to the people worshiping the elements, the lifting them up or carrying them about for adoration and reserving them um, for any pretended religious use are all contrary to the nature of this ordinance and to the institution of Christ. Um, uh, Joel, this, I think the section, uh, section 7, I think might be the section specifically at the bottom of section 7, uh, the body and blood of Christ are not present bodily or physically in the ordinance, but spiritually uh, to the faith of the believer, just as the elements themselves are uh, present to their, uh, in their outward senses or to their outward senses. Sounds yeah, pretty that's Calvin so, that sounds thinking. Pretty, pretty Calvinistic in that it's there's much, something much more. really there. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yep, and I think the Reformed Baptists would also add, if I could just add one more thing, is I think it's a covenant renewal service. And that's not just in partic particular to I the Lord's that. Supper, but the that. Lord's Day worship service, the gathering of the saints on the Lord's Day for worship um, and the it, administering of the ordinary means of grace is this covenant renewal ceremony. And, and so the Baptists would see baptism as like the wedding day. And so it's your entrance into faith, uh, into the kingdom, into the covenant people. Um, and so it's like your wedding day. But each Lord's Day, as we sit underneath the preaching of the word, we sing the word and, and we see the word in, uh, in baptism and in taking the Lord's Supper, uh, we see the, the word as it were. It's the, only, it's the only by sight thing that we're given as, as the people of God. Everything else, it's faith comes by hearing. But we get to see the word as it were in, in the sacrament of baptism, the Lord's Supper. And those are the only two sight kind of things that are prescribed. And in this, what we're doing is it's like if baptism is the wedding day, the first time you say your vows to your, your bride, um, the Lord's Supper, each Lord's Day corresponding, is the it's like a renewing of the vows. And, it, and, it, and it's, like, it's like in baptism, the one joins the many, right? The one individual joins the many, the people of faith. Uh, but in the Lord's Supper, uh, the many 
become one and they and they rejoin the one who is Christ. And that's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, even before 1 Corinthians 11, uh, he says, just as there is one bread, we who are many are one. And then he chastises the Corinthians for dividing themselves in the practice. How, how ironic and, and angering for the apostle that, that to, for there to be division at all, but especially to divide the people of God in the Lord's Supper. And so there's, there's this, you know, the one joins the many in baptism. That's your entrance into the covenant people, the, the wedding day. And then there's this renewing of the covenant every Lord's day where the many join the one in the Lord's Supper. And, um, and I think, I think that, that that would be a part of the Reformed Baptist view of the Lord's Supper. I love it. I love it. That's awesome. Okay, so as we talk about Reformed Baptists, you've also talked about Anabaptists. Uh, the Southern Baptist Convention is going on right now, and yeah. uh, Baptist has become a much bigger term than it once was. <laughs> so I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about that. You touched on the covenant versus dispensational theology. When you talk about Reformed Baptists, you're talking about we go back to the beginning of all that Baptist means, but now right. it's flowered out and it means a, a whole bunch more. So It basically means Christian now. So talk right. to us about that a little bit. What are some of the ways in which you see the word Baptist means more than it once did? Yeah, well, quick pause. I'd, I'd say pray for the Southern Baptist Convention. I mean, this represents... Yeah, I've, I've been praying well, for you it. Know, I'm not Southern Baptist, but I mean, it just represents a massive piece of, of the body of Christ in, in America today. And I, I just got to talk to Tom Askell and... I, they held a one-day conference right before the convention started trying to overturn Resolution 9 and um, things with critical race theory. And then there's big issues with women being uh, pastors. And uh, just there's just a lot of division in the convention right now, stuff with Russell Moore. So let's be praying that, um, that the Lord just unifies the movement and that they Amen. unify over truth. So That's good. Uh, yeah. but to Pray that they question, all get back to the 1689. Yep, <laughs> that would be great. That's, that's what. That's Joel, the goal. How happy would you be ministry. if, by the end of it, everybody at, at the SBC was <laughs> was 1689? Is that actually well, what you're praying for? Yeah, if that if that happened, yeah, I'm praying that God's will be done, and I know that that is his. That's his prescribed nice. will. That's his Praise revealed God. will. So praise God. Uh, and, anyways, but uh, but um, so all that being, yeah, if that happened, I I would join the Southern Baptist uh, Convention. <laughs> so, but to answer your question, Michael. Um, you know, Reformed Baptists, I think, you know, obviously there's there's a lot of chapters in the 1689, um, over 30 chapters, and, and there's a lot that's discussed. But if I was to boil it down to a few major tenets, this is what I would say. Six distinctives of Reformed Baptists. Number one would be the regular principle of worship. And I'm just going to list them, and then you guys can ask okay. questions. We can dive into them. But the regular principle of worship, right? So not just not just a believer's baptism, credo Baptist uh, position, but one is the regular principle of worship. Two is covenant theology. So uh, that's another thing that would distinguish a Reformed Baptist, 1689 guy from, like John MacArthur, for instance, right? He has Calvinistic soteriology, but he, by his own admission, is a leaky dispensationalist. Uh, he is not <laughs> confessional. He's not um, a covenant theologian. So regular principle of worship, covenant theology would be number two. Uh, Calvinism, and I'm using that, speaking to the five points regarding soteriology, that's number three. Um, here's a big one, the law of God. Um, a lot of different Baptists have different views of the law of God, especially how the law of God functions in the life of the Christian um, underneath the, the New Covenant um, in, and so in the New Testament. So the law of God, your view of the law of God and its function, its purpose. Um, and then number five would be, speaking of church polity, congregational. Right. So there's a ton of Baptists today that are elder rule. The con there's no scenario where the congregation has a vote. Right? And that would be a distinction from the 1689 that is congregational, if, if nothing else, in um, the ordination of officers in the church. So the 1689, I believe, would hold to definitely a male eldership, and I think it clearly holds to a male diaconate as well. And so it wouldn't allow for um, men and women to be deacons, which a lot of Baptists would, and I used to, and no longer. Um, so, But then it would go further and say, in the ordination of officers of the church, elders and deacons, uh, that it's done through the laying on of hands, in the case of elders, uh, elders and deacons, and prayer. There's laying on of hands and prayer. In the case of elders, there's also fasting is prescribed. Uh, but then, uh, but with both, ordaining elders or deacons, the, the last thing that's mentioned is the common suffrage of the saints, of the congregants, meaning uh, like women's suffrage, it's not the suffering of women, but it's their right to vote, it's their authority. And so the congregation actually appoints um, its officers. So there'll never be a pastor uh, that ultimately, he's not ordained um, by a presbytery, he's not ordained by a bishop or a cardinal, uh, he's not even ordained by the other, um, the, the already uh, existing elder board. He's ordained 
um, by the church that he's going to pastor, by the members of that church. And the sixth piece is confessional, all right? So it's, those are the six big distinctions is that, is that there's this regular principle of worship, the covenant theology, uh, the Calvinistic soteriology, a reformed soteriology, the law of God uh, being a major emphasis in its, in its use even underneath the new covenant, um, the congregational church polity, and then the confessional piece, holding to historic um, confession. Those would be big differences. Now, there's a lot of people that are gonna they're gonna hear regulative principle, and there's gonna be a lot there to unpack because I think a lot of our audience is got this evangelical background, and our, would be the idea of a regulative principle is actually quite foreign um, mm. because really. Uh, I, th- I think most of evangelicalism has kind of operated under this this thought process of if it's not contrary to Scripture, let's do it. Um, mm-hmm. But your the regulative principle seems to be the exact opposite, which is like, hey, if it's not mentioned in Scripture, we don't do it. So can you mm-hmm. can you maybe unpack what the regulative principle looks like in the 1689? What the the 1689 expressly condemns, uh, and then I have kind of some follow up question on the heels of that. But I think that that would be the the first start. Great. Yeah, so you're exactly right, Josh. The normative principle is as long as it's not forbidden would be kind of the, the language. Whatever God doesn't forbid in worship. And then you said, you know, mention. You use the word mention, but it'd, it'd be even stronger than that. The uh, regular principle of worship would be only what God, not just he mentions, but he prescribes. And and so only what God prescribes is the regular principle. Reg, regulative not coming from the word regular, but regulate. And so we're saying that God regulates um, the worship of his people, how God wants to be worshipped, it's regulated by his word. It's not a free-for-all, and it's not just don't do the things he forbids, but it's only stick to the things that he actually prescribes. And so I've written this um, to be brief. This is uh, one of the main reasons Baptists separated from Presbyterians, both particular or you Reformed Baptists, those are interchangeable, particular Baptists, Reformed Baptists, um, and Presbyterians come from Puritism. Um, which sought to reform the Church of England according to God's word, especially its Lord's Day worship. Now, when this became implausible due to Laud, William Laud, um, doing his high church, robes and tassels, all these different um, rituals of men, he was the Archbishop of Canterbury at the time in the Church of England, he made it impossible for the Puritans, both Presbyterian and Reformed Baptists, to actually reform the worship practices of the church because of his authoritarian, authoritarian um, opposition, the Puritans, both Reformed Baptists and Presbyterians alike, they separated from the Church of England or in in many cases were removed. Um, Now within the Puritan separation, um, one of the big things that got them kicked out of the Church of England or caused them to to remove themselves to leave the Church of England was the regular principle of worship. Uh, They saw William Laud and other leaders in the Church of England um, doing all kinds of things in Lord's Day worship that the Bible does not prescribe. But within this Puritan separation, some saw a need to apply the regular principle of worship um, all the way to infant baptism as well. And that was the crux. So considering Mm -hmm. the Reformed Baptists considered infant baptism um, to actually be, uh, or, or I should say forbidding infant baptism, to be the consistent outworking of the Puritan mindset, the Puritan mindset being this regular principle of worship. The Bible, the New Testament, does not prescribe the baptism of infants. And so the earliest Baptists believe that the elements of public worship are limited only to what Scripture commands. So let me quote the the 1689. This is chapter 22, paragraph 1. It says, The acceptable way of worshiping the true God is instituted by himself and so limited by his own revealed will that he may not be worshipped according to the imagination and devices of men, nor the suggestions of Satan under any visible representations, so not by sight, but by what we hear, the word, or any other way not prescribed in the Holy Scriptures. Now, many Baptists today, I'll finish with this, many Baptists today have completely abandoned the regular principle of worship in favor of an entertainment-oriented worship, consumerism, individual preferences, emotionalism, and pragmatism. That's the big one, and I see that all over the SBC. These Baptists, here's the irony, these Baptists have abandoned the very principle, namely the regular principle of worship, that led to the existence of Baptists in the first place. That's really why Baptists exist. It all Because if it wasn't for the regular principle of worship, 
we would have just it would have just been a bigger Presbyterian crowd, right? There would have been no real bifurcation within the Puritan group between the Presbyterians and the Congregationalist or the or the Reformed Baptists. The thing that that distinguished us, we were all reforming from William Laud and High Church and the Church of England and all of that. So all of that was going on, and we were doing that together, Presbyterians and Reformed Baptists alike. What caused us to separate from each other, distinguish from each other, was this regular principle of worship. And here's the tragic irony. Presbyterians today, about 500 years later, their church services, you, you see way more of the regular principle of worship, worshiping God according to what he prescribes than your average Baptist church. And so it's really a tragedy, I think, what, what Baptists have done. We, we separated from Presbyterians because we said they're not keeping to what God prescribes because they're baptizing infants. And then 500 years later, we're doing laser light shows, you know, and showing exegeting movie clips, you know, uh, church at the movies. And our Presbyterian brothers, for the most part, are still doing a pretty good job. So it's sad. It's so, so this is this is interesting. So the 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 door at Wittenberg that that Luther nails his thesis to 1517. People say that's when Reformation started, right? Now, what would be what you're talking about is a much further Reformation removed from yeah. that. Still, still going. 172 years later, 1689 is put together. 172 yeah. years. So what Luther and a lot of the early reformers were doing was saying, hey, there's, there's a lot in here that looks like tradition that doesn't look like Scripture. Um, and, but, but Luther and others would say, hey, we don't, we don't really want to get rid of tradition. What we want to do is we want to we want to use the tradition as long as it doesn't contradict Scripture. Now the Reformation keeps going and going and going. The the Church of England splits off from Roman Catholicism, and then these Puritans emerge from within that system, and they're like, "Man, this has got to be more pure than this." There's so much mixture still here. I don't see anything in the Scriptures about the, about this with the saints and, and praying to the saints. And some of the Anglicans are cool with that, and they're like, "No, no, no, that's nowhere prescribed in Scripture." Uh, and to your point, you're. There's some that were looking to baptism, the household baptism, and that's where it gets kind of into that nitty gritty. The Presbyterians are saying this looks we have a, an interpretation of history as a secondary authority source, and, and then you have your your Baptists that are saying, hey, this isn't prescribed, so we're not right. going to do it. The only prescription is once they believed, then they were baptized. So a, a pedo baptism. So this is more of a is this more of an epistemological, like how do we come to a knowledge of the truth and how to order our services? Um, I don't I mean, think so. I think it really is an exegetical difference. Um, I, I don't think it's epistemo epistemological, because I know what you're getting at, like, right? How do we know what we know? Um, no, I don't, I don't think that's it, because the Reformed Baptist is not a biblicist, and that's something that we could probably talk about, the heresy of biblicism, and it is a heresy. Um, a, a true biblicist if they go all the way through and follow the train of logic to its its natural destination, is going to say that the the Trinity doesn't exist, right? Because the word Trinity is not in, in the, the Bible. Right. And, and exactly. why don't you define biblicist for our audience? I saw somebody in our in our chat was saying, "This is over my head." I'm like, you know, so we got to define some terms as let, we go. Let's define some terms as we go. So, biblicist, how would you define it? Um, biblicist. I'm going to have to find that in my notes real quick. I, I mean, I wrote say, some stuff for that. I, I can give go, you. A, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, just the strictest definition is just that they're taking the Bible as kind of a wooden reading, uh, and they're not going to honor any kind of history or, or theology. Um, uh, tr they're kind of coming to an understanding on their own, independent it, it's, from... It's dude in his basement reading his yeah. Bible saying, right. this is this is what everything means. So like what Joel was dude saying... Dude man theology. Yeah, dude man theology. What Joel yeah. was saying at the beginning, like I got tired of doing theology a la carte, I wanted to step into a tradition that went, that's been going on for a very long time. Right. Uh, that... That's what we're saying. So biblicism yeah, would I, be not stepping into that great tradition. Um, yep. Well, it's a little no, bit different right. than that as well, because well, biblicism I, is just... Because there are people who don't want to go all in on a specific confession like the 1689, but they still want mm -hmm. to, to know what theology theologians and historians and, and how this is fleshed out throughout Christian history. Uh, well, that because wouldn't what you're saying, Josh... Tradition. Because what you're saying is they still care about, like, the witness of church history. That's the right. The witness of church history is strong with this one. You know, yeah. it's strong mm. with you, Josh. You know, so, like, the witness of church history is strong with you. You know, but, um, and, and, and so the biblicists, there is no witness of church history, right? That's it's right. not, a, it's not, for the biblicists, they're not going to say, oh, well, it's a secondary authority to the Bible. They're going to say, no, and, it's just a yeah, joke. And that's it's the language nothing. is secondary authority. Like, it, it is exactly. secondary. The Bible is first for you, Joel. The Bible's first. Mm -hmm. That's right. Of uh, course. Yeah. Yeah. 
but there is a, a church history trade- tradition and trajectory that you're not going to have some interpretation over here and uh, that no one in church history has had and say, well, it's just what the Bible says. But the biblicist will say yeah. that. And well, I, I think part of the problem is you got a bunch of it's a misunderstanding of sola scriptura, right? So sola scriptura, when we say you know scripture alone, what that means, people really misunderstand this. That does not mean that scripture is the only authority. It means scripture is the only infallible authority, and it is also the highest authority. But even in the concept, that's that's the irony. Even in the concept of sola scriptura, it acknowledges other authorities. Right, so scripture is the only, it's, it's not the only authority, it's the only infallible authority. Um, For salvation and, the, and life and, and practice. Right, and it's the yeah. highest uh, authority. And so, and so church history is a massive um, authority, and I think in some of our Protestant ways, we, we protest and reform a little bit too far from Rome, you know, that said there are two equal streams of tradition and scripture, and we say, no, no, no. Uh, they're not equal streams. But then what we do is we just stop up, we dam up the, 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 the other stream of, of church tradition altogether, and we make a mistake with that. I found what I, what I wrote on the Biblicism thing. Is it okay if I... Yeah, sure. absolutely. Go sure. ahead. Okay, so this kind of falls underneath the confessional piece. Being confessional, that's a distinction with Reformed Baptists and then just Baptists in general. So historic uh, Reformed Baptists were confessionalists. Uh, they were not bare Biblicists. Biblicists deny words and doctrines not expl- explicitly stated in Scripture. And they deny that the church's historic teaching about the Bible has any secondary authority in biblical interpretation. The early Baptists, however, did not believe that individual church members or individual pastors should interpret the Bible divorced from the historic teaching of the church. Hebrews 13.7 would be one of the scriptures they would cite to back that up. Uh, they believe that the Bible alone is sufficient for doctrine and practice, but they also believe the Bible must be explained and read in light of the church's interpretive tradition. 1 Timothy chapter 3.15, right? The, the church is the pillar and the buttress of the truth. So scripture tells me something about the authority of the church in its, in its defense of the truth, but also its supports. It holds up um, the truth. The church does that. And so... Um, so, so this is this is interesting. Uh, Acts chapter two verse thirty one would be one refutation of the heresy of biblicism because the apostles in Acts chapter two verse thirty one um, explain Psalm sixteen. They're talking about Psalm sixteen, but they do it in words that are not explicitly used in Psalm sixteen. And so, one of the things that you see. Um, that's anti-biblicism is you see the apostles use of the psalms the apostles use of isaiah the apostles use of the old testament and so a biblicist would basically say th- this is what it all comes down to it comes down to your hermeneutic how do you read scripture how do you interpret scripture and and a lot of baptists today that, that fall closer into that i'm not saying they're you know heretical level of biblicism but they're in they're in biblicism territory is uh guys who would have the the historic grammatical, literal, hermeneutic. Uh, but here's the one piece that they're missing, because I would adhere to all of that. The one piece that they're missing that Presbyterians would have, uh, that Reformed Baptists would have, is analogical, analogous, or typological hermeneutic, mm-hmm. right? Amen. So yes, still historic, yes, still um, uh, grammatical, and all those kinds of things, right? We're going to look at different literature in the Bible, right? I'm not going to exegete Matthew the same way I do the Psalms, something that's poetic literature. Um, however, I, I have this... Uh, this analogous piece, uh, the doctrine of analogy, the banner of analogy, the typological, and that's the way you see the disciples. When you see the apostles exegete the Old Testament, they are not afraid of saying, this is an analogy. This is a symbol that points towards this, you know, and, and, but then, but then the biblicists would say, well, the apostles can do that and we can't do that. And I would say, we can do that and we're going to get it wrong sometimes. Um, but that's not something that's just re- reserved to the apostles. We as Christians, yeah. in following the witness of church history, can read the Bible, and especially pieces in the Old Testament, not just from a strict literal hermeneutic, but with an analogous understanding, a typological interpretation of the Scripture. That's good. So let's let's get back to that 1689 um, in talking about the, the regulative principle. Um, I think there's a lot of ways this can be handled. I'm curious of all 1689 or some 1689. When I hear people talk about the regulative principle, I, I often think of my Church of Christ buddies who are like, hey, the Bible doesn't expressly uh, command for us to use musical instruments in the gathering of our assembly for our psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Uh, therefore, uh, we are going to prohibit it because it's not expressly commanded for us to act on. Do all people in the 1689 kind of fall under that same umbrella? Uh, Is there a variety of positions there? 
Yeah, there's a variety. Um, but that is a that is a fair point. And so, you know, with, with musical instruments, you know, people will be quick to look at, at the psalms, and like, you know, praise him with the tambourine and the harp and the lyre. Um, but but the point is uh, the New Testament. Um, because because what... So the person who says that instruments shouldn't be used, that the regular principle um, forbids the use of instruments in Lord's Day worship today under, under the New Covenant, uh, what that person would say is that the instruments belong um, to Israel, um, theocratic Israel. And so in the same way that we don't sacrifice animals any longer, in the same way that um, the priests, you know, in the Levitical priesthood wear certain robes and tassels and d different garments, um, in the same way that we've done away with the priestly sacrificial system, they would say that instruments belonged to that that old covenant priestly sacrificial uh, system and that you don't ever see a, a prescription of instruments in worship with New Testament saints by the apostles. And so that would be the argument. Um, and then some people would go even further with, you know, spiritual songs and hymns and psalms, and they would actually say that the Psalter, the 150 chapters of the Psalms in the Bible, can actually be broken up into three different categories of psalms. So it's not just psalms and then songs that we write, uh, but actually hymns are a type of psalm in the Psalter, yeah. and spiritual songs are a type of psalm in the Psalter. And so you would have, those would be your exclusive psalm singers, and they would all be a cappella. Uh, there would be no instrument, um, instrumental accompaniment. And so those would be people who only sing the psalms. Um, they put them to melody, um, and they are singing them because the New Testament prescribes singing, uh, corporate singing, but it would only be the psalms. Um, I personally, um, our church, Covenant Bible Church, is not using instruments in worship. Um, I don't have a really strong stance on that. Uh, Reformed Baptists will fall on both sides. Very few of them are exclusive psalm singers. Um, more, more, you'd find more guys not using instruments than you'd find guys not singing like um, a, a, a modern-day hymn, for instance. So... so. Let, let, it would be safe to say you don't have any prophetic art at your church then if you guys aren't using music <laughs> no no prophetic finger paintings yeah. none of that none of that okay uh, but they probably would I use just. uh they probably would use what's the word for the the bullhorn deal but it's not a bullhorn the shofar, shofar. The shofar. The word. hey shofar show good let's get this worship on the road um no. go ahead, Mike. okay that's probably too old testament there's no shofar in the new testament that's old so. testament that belongs yeah. to israel i don't know yeah, there there's go. a trumpet hey, in uh, the book of revelation Joel, I, I know one of the big <laughs> things you really wanted to talk about was the law of god and it's one of the distinctives and uh and and maybe we can dovetail that into talking a little bit about theonomy. Uh, but can you talk to us about the Reformed Baptist understanding of the law of God and how that's distinct from how uh, maybe other other Southern Baptists or just other denominations would view it? Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, Reformed Baptists, reading again here, Reformed Baptists believe that the Ten Commandments are the summary, or the Decalogue Ten Commandments are the summary of God's moral law that we find in Exodus chapter 20. Uh, we also find uh, in Matthew chapter 5 and Romans chapter 2, uh, they believe that unless we rightly, Reformed Baptists believe that unless we rightly understand the law, uh, we cannot understand the gospel. The gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ kept the law for our justification. He kept the law in our place, right? Jesus, and we, we got to understand this in terms of justification. He didn't just die in our place. He lived in our place. Um, and so in dying in our place, he took upon himself our penalty. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. Um, but he lived in our place. And so that gets into the passive obedience of Christ and the active obedience, which is a major theme uh, for those who are reformed. Uh, John Owen talks a lot about the active obedience of Christ. He fulfilled, right? He didn't just avoid, uh, he didn't just preserve innocence by avoiding sin um, and, then, and then passively obey uh, God by dying in our place. Uh, but he also lived in our place. And his act of obedience is that he didn't just avoid sin, but he fulfilled all righteousness. That's what he says to John the Baptist when John the Baptist says, I can't baptize you. You should be baptizing me. But he said, I got to get baptized, John, to fulfill all righteousness, to fulfill everything under the law. So therefore, while justified believers are free from the law um, as a covenant of works in order to earn justification and eternal life. We see that in Romans chapter 7, verse 1 through 6. However, God gives them the law as a standard of conduct or a rule of life in their sanctification. Romans chapter 8, verses 4 through 7. So God's moral law, the Ten Commandments, including the Sabbath commandment, the Fourth Commandment, um, we see that Mark chapter 2, 27, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 through 10, is an instrument of sanctification in the life of the believer. Believers rest in Christ alone for their total justification. But um, 
but they are looking to the law in sanctification. Not that the law itself sanctifies them, but as a guide. It's the third use of the law. So you get into the first, second, third use of the law. Now, Baptists who hold to uh, New Covenant theology or progressive covenantalism or dispensationalism, um, all of them are going to have a different view of the law. They're all going to, they're not going to esteem the law in the way that uh, the Reformed Baptist would. They're going to get rid of the Sabbath. Reformed Baptist would be the only branch of Baptist that would hold to the fourth commandment still being instituted for New Testament Christians today. Uh, we see the, the Sabbath being not abrogated, um, not removed, but renewed from the last day of the week to the first day of the week by virtue of Christ and his resurrection. Um, and so we, we see the Decalogue continuing. We see Jesus when he says, love God, love people, right? Love the Lord your God, the greatest commandment. The second is like it, love uh, your neighbor as yourself. We would see Jesus, this is Jesus' exegesis um, and his synopsis, summary of the Decalogue. The Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, is two tables. The first four commandments deal with uh, man's obligation to God himself. The next six commandments, commandment number five, picking up with honoring your father and mother, all the way to ten, do not covet, uh, deals with um, our obligation to our fellow man, to our neighbor. And so Jesus, he doesn't come to abolish the moral law, uh, but rather he comes to fulfill it. And so you have to understand there's three divisions of the law and three uses of the law. The three divisions of the law is the moral, the civil, and the ceremonial. The three uses of the law, is the first use of the law, the, the best way to think of it as kind of an analogy that's helpful is the first use of the law is it's a mirror. And, and what I mean by that is the law, it, it reflects the holiness of God himself. The law is perfect because God is perfect. It's a reflection of God's own character. And when we look into the law of God, um, it, it doesn't just reveal God's holiness, but by virtue it re reveals our sinfulness. And like Charles Spurgeon used to say, a man cannot appreciate the beauty of Christ unless he first comes to see the necessity for Christ. So the first use of the law is to reveal our, our utter lack, um, our, our utter sin, and our need for a savior is to drive us to the cross. The second use of the law is, is more of a common grace use of the law, and it's to ultimately to hold evil at bay. Um, it's it's, it's gover civil governments, um, right? That, that mur more murder would take place um, if civil governments did not um, legislate laws against murder, right? With, with even, you know, the passing of Roe versus Wade, abortion went from 200,000 approximately per year to about, a you know, quickly to, to a million uh, babies are murdered a year. It turns out, you know, we always say, we're never going to get rid of abortion, you know, by legislation. It's going to be heart transformation. Well, it actually turns out that, yes, we do need transformed hearts, but even unredeemed hearts, team to, they, they tend to gravitate towards whatever sin is legal. <laughs> you know, uh, cr criminals tend to gravitate towards w whatever they can get away with. And so the second use of the law is, is a shield. So first use, a mirror drives us to Christ. Second use, a shield. It, it helps societies not be utterly utterly lost, even pagan societies, because the, the moral law of God is written on the hearts of even unbelievers. That's the conscience. That's natural law. The third use of the law is like um, a guide or a compass. So mirror, shield, and compass. Um, and that's what David says. I delight in the law. I love the law. It's a lamp unto my feet. Or how can a young man keep his way pure? Um, by keeping it according to thy word, thy law. And so David delights in the law of God. And so none of that says that the law saves. Uh, right? The first use of the law simply says the law reveals, it, it makes the sinner aware that he needs to be saved, not by the law, but by a savior, by Christ. The second use is, is a common grace use, even for the unbeliever. It, it, the law of God written on hearts, because we're all made in God's image, natural law, keeps societies from getting to like that Genesis 6 level, where God wipes out the whole world. Um, and, and, you know, at the, at the surface level. And then the third use of the law is even for the Christian upon redemption, now converted, still the question remains, all right, so we love him because he first loved us. First John four nineteen. All right. I love God because, because I'm a Christian now and God's opened my eyes to see how much he's loved me. I want to love you with everything, God, as a response, not to elicit your love, but as a response for the love I freely have in Christ Jesus. So, so how do I love you, God? How do I bless your heart? Well, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey me. Okay, great. Obey what? Well, love God and love people. Okay, in what way? What does it look like to love God and love people? Oh, the Ten Commandments. Yeah. Love hey. the Lord your God with all your heart. It's broken, right? It's broken down right there. Go so we've got Sorry. we've got like I think seven minutes before we've got to wrap up. I mean we're we're already three minutes over here on 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 the time clock. I, I want to run through these points for people who didn't catch them, and I want to probably get you back on to cover some of these subjects. I want to try to cover as many as we can on the law of God. Michael and I were just talking about theonomy. We had Doug Wilson come on and talk about theonomy. I want to touch on that with you, Joel, but I don't know that we can do that 
fairly in this segment. Calvinism, we've done stuff on Calvinism. We kind of unpacked the law. Uh, we, we, we can talk about congregationalism, confessionalism next time. I think, could you maybe unpack for us the covenant theology and, and maybe contrast that with what would be dispensational theology? As dispensationalism is a very popular view right now, uh, I, I would just love to hear you explain what does covenant theology look like? Um, if, if you feel like we can do it in a timely way, we can even maybe contrast the, the covenant of works found in both Adam and in Christ versus the covenant of grace that we have access to. Uh, and even that, man, we, we need, yeah. we could spend 40 minutes unpacking that. No, but that's great. Yeah. I'll do my best. So the Reformed Baptist Fathers, um, you know, about 100 particular Baptists in London who got together and signed the 1689, uh, but two in particular, Nehemiah Cox and Benjamin Keach, um, they believed uh, very, very vehemently that an alteration of the doctrine of the covenants is an alteration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, because the gospel necessarily includes the fulfilling of the covenant of works by the second Adam, who is Christ, that was broken by the first Adam. So the second Adam endured its curses, the curses of, of the law or the covenant of works, um, and established its blessings. Right. So this covenant of grace is, in, in a sense, um, it's the blessings of the covenant of works actually working, the covenant of works actually being fulfilled, actually being obeyed. And then Christ, the head of the church, um, he receives all the blessings of the covenant of works by his fulfillment of it, by his perpetual obedience. And then through the head, our union with Christ by the spirit and through faith, he as the head lets all the blessings of the father and his fulfillment of the covenant of works and the blessings that he incurred by it flow down to his people. So the second Adam endured its curses and established, he endured the curses of the covenant of works and established the blessings of the covenant of works for all those who were chosen by God to be represented by the second Adam in the covenant of grace. This is the idea of, of federal headship, that Jesus is, uh, there are only two federal heads, Adam and Christ. And at the end of the day, um, there are only two identities, right? Our, our world is obsessed with identity um, and all these different identities, but there's really only two primary identities that a person can have. Uh, they're either in Adam or in Christ. If they're in Adam, they're dead. They're condemned. Um, if they're in Christ, they're alive. They're justified. Uh, they're blessed. And um, But both of these have to do with the covenant of works. Adam, and um, he failed to keep the covenant of works. And there was, God extended to him both a benefit upon his fulfillment, and also he, um, he threatened curses upon his disobedience. Now the benefit was, um, was eternal life. And so what Adam had when he was first created in a state of innocence... Right, so pre prelapsarian, uh, before the fall, when Adam was created in the state of innocence, um, it was a state of innocence, but it was not a state of immutability, meaning it, he could change, he could undergo change. So Adam was created uh, uh, able to do good, but also able to do evil. Right, he was innocent without sin. Um, and he was given the covenant of works. And this is important, a lot of people don't know this, but the covenant of works given to Adam was actually 11 commandments, not, not, not one and not 10, but 11. Um, it was 10 moral commandments, the law of God written on his heart, which includes even the Sabbath, and then one positive precept not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So Adam had 11 commandments, right? If Adam never ate of the tree, but he murdered his wife, the covenant of works would have been broken, right? So we assume it's that the, the moral law written on the heart of man is assumed. And so we say the moral law comes into existence, the 10 commandments, long before Mount Sinai. Um, the moral law is eternal as God is eternal. Um, and, and it first appears with man and human creation in the heart of Adam. It's written on his heart. And, and, and he knows that, that stealing is wrong. He knows coveting is wrong. He knows that murder is wrong. And, and he knows even that, that to break the Sabbath is wrong. Why? Because, because even the Sabbath came before Adam was, well, came right after Adam was created because God showed Adam um, by a creation ordinance that he rested. He worked on six days and rested on the seventh. And so those 10 commandments were on his heart with one extra, an 11th commandment, not thou shalt be nice, uh, but rather don't eat of the, the fruit of the tree. That's a positive <laughs> That's precept. And so this is what's given to Adam. He, If he was to fulfill the covenant of works, um, this is another really interesting thing that people don't think of. Adam had an eschaton. There was an es eschatology for Adam. Um, and the eschatology was that there's a second tree, namely the tree of life. And, and even though death only entered the world through sin, so you could argue, well, didn't Adam already have eternal life? If he never sinned, he would never die. Um, but what most guys say, most Reformed guys, both Presbyterian and Reformed Baptists, is they say that, that it, was, it was almost like a trial period. 
um, that, that Adam had to uphold the covenant works, obey these 11 commandments for a trial period. And, and that eventually what would have happened if he did not fail, God would have, would have condescended to him and he would have extended to him the tree of life. And this is why some guys, it is a covenant of works, but some guys still understand it as a covenant of grace of sorts. Um, and, and what that means is God ne- did not owe Adam um, eternal life, the tree of life, meaning to, to make him immutable where he could never fall. So the tree of life was not what was sustaining Adam in the garden so that he didn't die. No, Adam was, was sustained in the garden and not dying because, because death hadn't entered the world. And death hadn't entered the world because, as Paul tells us in Romans, death entered through sin and sin hadn't entered the world because Adam was upholding the covenant for however long that was. But what Adam was always able to do was fall from grace. He could, he could, he was able to uphold the covenant, but he was also able to break it. And so if he had passed this trial period, eventually what would have happened is God would have extended to him the tree of life. Adam would have been able to eat of this tree and, and all of a sudden, um, he would, it would have been this, he would have reached a state, not just of innocence, but of righteousness, of, of fulfilled righteousness, what Christ did. Um, and and been immutable as we will be in heaven or as the angels now are, um, unable to fall from grace. But Adam broke the covenant and Adam was the federal head, the representative of, of all his posterity and not just human beings, uh, but actually Adam was the federal head of, of all earthly creation. That's why God says, curse is the ground. Not, not just your sons and your wife, but curse is the ground because of you, Adam. It's going to produce thorns and thistles. So all creation is groaning, right? All creation is, is, is weary underneath the curse that Adam brought in. And so everyone, by virtue of physical birth, is, is underneath the federal headship of the first Adam. And therefore, they are a covenant breaker by nature and by choice. And therefore, uh, the wages of breaking the first covenant is death. They are spiritually dead and they're going to endure an eternal death if God does not mercifully intervene. But for all those who, by grace through faith, are unified, united to Christ, Christ came and fulfilled the covenant of works that was given to Adam, but it's even better. See, our eschatology as New Testament Christians is actually better than the state of innocence that that Adam was created in and even better than Adam's eschatology if he had achieved it and eaten of the fruit of life and been immutable because the covenant of works that Christ fulfilled, the context in which he did it, is insane. Adam, let's say he was, you know, he was a full-grown man. As a full-grown man, he needed to obey 11 commandments in a perfect garden, protected, well provided for, with only one other person, his wife, to possibly tempt him, uh, Christ had to obey the covenant of works from a, a as a toddler. I mean, anybody who has a two-year-old, right? Jesus was a perfectly righteous two-year-old. He had so Adam got to start off as a full-grown man in a protected vacuum environment. Jesus was thrown into the world in the incarnation, already under sin, with evil men, with one of his disciples being a, a betrayer. A, you know, all these kinds of things uh, being ridiculed. He came to his own, but they received him not, and he had to do it from childhood, from toddlerhood, all the way to adulthood, and suffer unto death. And so Jesus, the covenant of works, is the same covenant of works, but the the context in which he fulfilled. It, uh, his, and, and the fact that he didn't just die in our place, but lived as our substitute, lived in our place. Uh, he took our sin upon his shoulders, right, and 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 took our penalty. But but his righteousness is imputed to us. There are there are right now the four living creatures covered with eyes, right. the twenty four elders. There are angels before the throne of God covering their face, and they've never sinned. But you and I, the righteousness that we're clothed in, is not the righteousness of cherubim and seraphim. It's not the righteousness of the heavenly elders. It's the righteousness of God. It's a higher eschaton. And and my whole point is that's the, the good news of the gospel. That's a that's a robust gospel, but it breaks down without covenant theology. Does that make sense? Bro, it makes it makes it's perfect sense. And it is sense. and anyone who's in the comment section that the comments, wasn't saved, comments eating you up, bro. Done got sa- bro, you get amen from <laughs> from all kinds of traditions. They ain't Reformed got no sixteen eighty nine in their name. Oh but. boy, I'm a big fan of Joel. Yeah. Okay. So you're, gonna, <laughs> cool. you're gonna get some good stuff. Praise God. And uh, uh, we're we're probably going to need to start another beard competition. Who's got the best beard of Remnant <laughs> no, Radio? I just, because it's I not can, even fair, bro. I can beardly I the stand the can. comments. No, I mean of our guests. Obviously, we can't. <laughs> Thank compete. you. Thank you. I, when I, if you go back in the archives, I got this Amish thing going. Anyway, uh, Joel, how do people follow you, man? Uh, how do they how do they follow your ministry? I want to have you back on to, to discuss Tell some of this stuff. Tell them about your but, podcast. Uh, but yeah, books, podcasts, all that stuff. We'll link it in the description for people who haven't checked it out yet. 
Yeah, thanks so much. So um, right now I'm in the North Austin area, Hutto, Texas, Covenant Bible Church. It's a brand new church plant. I just left California at the end of last year. We've got about 20 people worshiping God in my living room. I know what you're thinking. Our living room's prescribed. And yes, they are. They worshiped in houses. In the nice. So, uh, so anyway, so we're worshiping <laughs> in my living room. So if you're in that area, I would love to have you. We're, we're, we're planting a 1689 Reformed Baptist Church. Beyond that, I'm the president of Right Response Ministries. So you can go to rightresponseministries.com, check out some of our stuff. But the best thing to do is just probably go to our YouTube channel, just like you guys, a lot of you do with Remnant Radio. So go to Right Response Ministries, our YouTube channel, and you'll find we've got different shows. We've got one called Theology Applied, where we have guests on. And we talk about not just exegeting text, but actually applying our, our, our theology. We get into theonomy. We get into all these kinds of things, covenant theology, um, birth control. civil law, birth control. Michael, yeah, Michael Roundtree was one of our guests that we had recently. We've had Doug Wilson. He's coming on again. We had James Coates recently from Edmonton, Alberta, and talked about stuff with that. Uh, Post Mill stuff with Jeff Durbin. So Theology Apply is a big one. And then I got a couple other shows that you could check out, a Q&A show. Um, but that's that's the main thing. Go to our YouTube channel. Check out Right Response Ministries. Check out our podcast. And if you're in the North Austin, Texas area, um, come and check out Covenant Bible Church. I'd love to have you. And, and guys, I really want to encourage you guys to do this because there there are a lot of guys that are going to disagree with us theologically, and we wouldn't encourage you to shy away from that. In fact, we would encourage encourage you to engage with that. Uh, I think Joel's channel is going to be very different from our channel in many ways. I mean, he's a cessationist, he's a 1689 guy. I mean, neither of those are things that we would hold here, uh, but, but but Joel is a safe space. I mean, you heard him just there preach a strong gospel presentation rooted in the scripture, why he believes what he believes. He has a, a strong foundation for that. That's something that we need to engage with. So I really encourage you to go check out his channel. He's got a lot of great content on there. Much of it we're going to disagree with, but he's going to agree with it just for his own own safety for people who are going to try to destroy him from coming on Remnant Radio. Joel <laughs> clearly disagrees with much of what we produce here. Uh, uh, you know, he's not affirming us by just coming on the channel. Uh, but that's part of, I think, what we need to be doing uh, as Christians is engaging with people that we disagree with and learning from one another. I think I think that's a, it's a beneficial thing. So go check out Joel's channel. Go subscribe to his stuff. Listen to some of his podcasts. It's going to be great. If you haven't already, go check out last week's, last week's, yesterday's episode with Sean McDowell. We talked about the historicity of the martyr of the apostles of Christ. We talked about the apostles and the, and the kind of myth that surrounds them. Is this history? Uh, this is historical fact that all of them died this martyr's death, or, or which ones do we know? Uh, it's, it's, a it's a great conversation there. there. We've got, uh, got uh, uh, James White coming on the show here pretty soon. Uh, he would be very much in line with much of uh, Joel's uh, thoughts on these subjects. Uh, and I will be up in uh, Apologia Church uh, the end of August. So if you're out in the Arizona area, I'm going to be on the Cultish Podcast and love to maybe grab coffee with some of you guys out there. So hit me up at an email. Media at the Remnant Radio. Maybe we can hang out with some of you guys if you happen to be up in the Arizona area. Michael, do you have any closing thoughts before we wrap things up? That's it, man. Okay, subscribe. make sure to subscribe to the video, guys. Like it. Coming out with lots of really cool content. If you haven't given already, you've been blessed by the content, uh, check out the stuff on Patreon in the description. Really cool stuff going out there. We've got a book club on uh, 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 Kingdom of the Cults with Walter Martin. It'll help us produce content like this since we're entirely crowdfunded, and you get some really cool content and grow in a, in a community of believers, which I think is fun. Not to be confused with the local church because All right. we're Oh, not. yeah, and check out our Wednesday show tomorrow to be continued. Talk about, Talk about devils. Demons. Blessings, guys. We'll see you next time.